support this podcast, go to positivesarcasm.com slash donate. Any amount is appreciated. Once again, positivesarcasm.com slash donate. Thank you and enjoy the program. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by pbandjoey.com. Simple, honest, and delicious. Go to pbandjoey.com for more information. $35 or more gets you free shipping. pbandjoey.com. That's pbandjoey.com. Jay here, PositiveSarcasm.com, recorded here at the Spare Parts Studios. Happy Sunday, everybody. Congratulations to my friend and consigliere, Bobby, for uh, tying the knot in a backyard wedding. Uh, Picks and possibly a video to come, but, and more from that. But in the meantime, you can find me at Instagram, at positive underscore sarcasm. You can find me on Facebook.com slash POS Sarcasm, if you still use social media after the recent shit show up in the past uh, six months to a year. What else? Hmm... Is it TikTok at Positive Sarcasm? You can follow someone else. Find also find me on YouTube. YouTube, Positive Sarcasm and Positive Sarcasm Podcast. And you can find me throughout the rest of the world. You can find me on the Googles. You can email me directly. You can support this platform in any way, shape, or form. And, of course, you can find my podcast wherever podcasts are available. Yes, we got to start with the wedding stuff in the backyard. I went to a wedding, the first wedding of this year. Yes, I brought my gear. Uh... It's crazy because, I mean, obviously all the weddings I was either contracted to do or invited to go to, they were all canceled because of COVID, you know. And uh, it was nice to kind of move things along. And granted, it wasn't the wedding that people had wanted. You know, you want a big wedding and you want this stuff and you want that stuff there and you want it to be in this venue. And it's just, hey, literally did it was not a matter of choice. It was a lack of options. But to see what could be done. Like, have you ever been to, like, one of those Staten Island backyard weddings where everybody's just crammed into, like, a small backyard with a high picket fence? And it's, it's I believe there's a movie called Easy Money with Ronnie Dangerfield. And you see from the uh, a bird's eye view of just everybody dancing and clapping, but it's right in a small backyard of a Staten Island home. And it just, it wasn't filled to capacity like this, but to personify the, the amount of work you can do in a small area. Like, there was... Like there was this whole section for for drinks and food and ice and champagne. There was another gazebo set up really last minute to just sit down and, and chill out, maybe a fire pit. There was another one set up to lounge and it was where the where the vows were done. And then there was the entire porch area, which was literally just used as a staging area to bring the bride down. And it was just it was just a, a standard rural backyard, but there was so much potential for so much more there that it was really awesome to see the whole layout of what can be done on a but even if I mean they didn't first of all they didn't really have a budget they didn't need it to they could have spent whatever they wanted to but to do what they did with what they had is nothing short of impressive so that's you know venues take notice you better open up soon or people are going to start uh, exchanging vows in their own backyard if they're not already but uh it's one thing normally when I'm out in public, I find a when I'm at a big social thing, I, I do three things. I one, I either play bartender. Two, I'm usually uh, I, I assign myself a task of either be or I'm contracted to do a job there, such as like doing video or whatever. And three, I just keep my mouth shut and I generally just stay quiet and out of the way or I go find a dog to pet. I, we've had this conversation before on this podcast of, about am I talking too much? Am I slouching? How's my breath? And all the the social awkward cues. And this one actually has a lot to tie into when you're having a conversation with somebody you've never met. You don't know their background. You don't know where they work or how they employ themselves or how they feed themselves or what they do to take care of themselves, their sensitivities. But you take the risk of having a conversation with somebody regardless of what your blood alcohol content was because for the first time in a few days or in the first time in several months, was the first time I actually tried to, I attempted to consume a beverage uh, for the mere fact that it was a $650 bottle and I literally wanted a small sip of it. But I didn't really have, did I have a lot to drink? I had a couple drinks. I didn't have too many. But I was having a, 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 I met somebody there to just, not really met them, they were there wandering and I don't know how we got into conversation, but it turned into an actual conversation uh, fueled with, I wanted to know something. I mentioned a statistic they rebutted it with some with, with with some other information, and then we realized that her and I have worked in the same field. So I was, obviously I was like, "All right, cool. 
Finally, I go out of my way to shoot my mouth off twice a week on a podcast. I go through so much data and dig through so much bullshit on a daily basis trying to find the right information that I might have potentially found somebody who is smart enough uh, and educated enough and informed enough to actually give me the information I've been dying to find overall. I've been dying for somebody who can tell me what the problem is, how to dissect the information that we find online, just in general, not about a particular issue, but we came to, on common ground here. And obviously, I when I see some when I see somebody who looks smart, looks educated, looks like they have uh, some direction in their life, I will push them for information. And sometimes I would like to use generic information that's thrown out there to see how they respond to it, and to see if they have if they can fire back with something that I find of value. And when you push somebody and they have an answer, it's like cool. Sometimes you have to push somebody to get. Verbally push somebody to get the have their potential come out, but in either case, it's not a strategy to, for a conversation because the conversation should be generic. But sometimes, if you want an answer out of somebody, you got to kind of get them to get in that position to give you that answer. Um, and sometimes, like when people ask me, when people sometimes people you ask them for somebody a question, you ask them what they do or where they live. Sometimes they don't voluntarily ask that answer the question. Or they give you an answer that's relatively vague because maybe they don't think what they say or what they do or who they are is of really any value because then they feel like they're gloating. But I want to know what this person does. I wanted to know what information they had that could be of any value to me. And when I realized there was a lot, we were coming from two different angles, but for, with a lot of the same, a lot of the similar experience. Similar experience? Yeah, we'll just go with that. I just make words with my faces. Try to keep up, okay? And... She started spouting some stuff at the end. I was like, okay, I get what she's saying. I agree with that. I like where she's coming from. And she's coming from a position where there could be some progress made in that field. And as I was having a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the, in the boundaries and the safety of a home where we didn't need interrupters or third-party intermediaries or anybody to interrupt this conversation that was about to successfully land with the right amount of information that I needed to exit the conversation. We were gonna, we finally uh, reached a pinnacle of, cool, here's the problem. What do we do about it? And right when she was about to give some answers to that information, the next thing I realized is there's a third party standing there, a third party that wasn't invited to the conversation, maybe is just listening in. And if you were listen, and if you listen to this podcast, you know that I put clips that if you just take them for what they are, completely out of context, you would be appalled. But when you put it into context, it generally makes perfect sense. But when you step into a conversation where you don't know what we're talking about, and then number two, you don't follow, apparently according to the spruce.com, the rules of how to interrupt a conversation, if you should at all, then you run into problems. Because when you do that, interrupting a conversation that has a lot of... Uh, built quickly built depth behind it with a, not, a lot of knowledge a lot of experience and a lot of thirst for knowledge when you interrupt a conversation you are what you're doing is you're disrupting thought and by disrupting thought you're literally breaking down the entire system of progress and how to evolve we're trying to do something here we're trying to solve problem i'm trying to make myself more intelligent by listening to somebody who is more educated and want, I want the information from them so I can do better in, in sparsing the information that I present to you on this podcast or through my articles or on videos or just as a gentleman in general. And when you butt into the conversation with whatever the fuck you have to say, you're, you're a thought disruptor. Okay? So what the next thing that better come out of your mouth, if you're going to disrupt someone's thought, the, the thing that better come out of your mouth better be the fucking invention to curing cancer. Otherwise, what you just did was in rudely interrupt somebody's conversation. So you are now a thought disruptor. And now what you're doing is because things are seemingly out of context because you came in at the very end of the conversation, you now have a bias of opinion. Okay? And you're only coming in because you didn't hear the you didn't hear the beginning, the interaction, the build up, the co the conflict of information, the similarities in thought, and then the identification of the problem, and then the, the answer that concludes the entire issue, you now have your own bias of opinion because of your background and the fact that you want to get involved because you want to seem more intelligent like you have all the answers. When in fact you don't. You're just pointing a you're just telling somebody uh, what's the problem and who's to blame for it 
when in fact you're to blame for the fact that you just interrupted this entire conversation that you, me and somebody else are having with your own bullshit. And then also it goes on to that because you're also, when you come in and interrupt a conversation and you're now practicing, you're now telling me about something. When I can clearly look you up, and yeah, sometimes you can judge a book by its cover, all right? If you come into me and you start talking about uh, science and health and wellness and microbiology, when you're fucking 40 pounds overweight, you have um, absolutely no clue who the fuck we are and what we were trying to figure out from the very beginning of our conversation, and then you come in and you drop your own opinion based on your shit that we didn't ask for, well, that kind of pisses me off. And that's a, that's a hypocrisy of knowledge. You interrupt with your own information that we weren't talking about. Okay? Next up. Now you interrupted, your, you interrupted a conversation with two people trying to find a wavelength in which they can communicate on. So when you do that and you interrupt a conversation and one person decides to bow out of the conversation, they decide to bow out. Now it's just me. Well, if you don't understand who I am, which I don't, I get it. If you just interrupt me, if you just meet me for the first time and I'm on a roll, I can be rather aggressive with my word speak. And, but if you're going to interrupt my conversation, just know you're going to get all of it. If we're meeting for the first time, you get a PG version of me. Parental guidance suggested. But if you're going to interrupt my conversation, you're going to get the brunt of it. And when I choose to use words that you don't like and immediately you end the conversation by saying, I'm going to go over there, guess what? Stay the fuck over there because I don't want to talk to you anymore and I'm just going to pretend like you don't even exist. Because if you're going to come into a conversation that has some rocky terrain on it, that guess what? The truth to enlightenment is not paved. So you're going to hit some bumps and some pebbles, and you might get a flat tire along the way. But in order to get where you need to go, you're going to hear and see some shit you don't like. That's conversation. That's the path to enlightenment. And it's not paved in fucking gold. So, newsflash, if you're going to end a conversation because you immediately hear a word that you don't like, guess what? You're never going to get anywhere. So take your fat ass over to that fucking gazebo because I don't want to interact with you anymore because everything you say at this point is completely Hippocratic. Is that the word? Yeah, it is. So, that being said, there are, I've now presented to you a problem, interrupting a conversation. So, on this podcast, let's go ahead and find nine ways to politely interrupt a conversation. If you are, and I'm just, I just is the first article I picked up. So let's just go ahead and see if any of these have any validity to them. All right. Number one, timing. If there is an emergency, the person is saying something that you know is incorrect, the group is gossiping about someone who isn't there, or is there any other strong reason to stop the discussion, stopping or interrupting discussion, you may interject as long as you do it politely. Knowing when and how to interrupt is essential if you want others to see you as polite, gracious, thoughtful, and interesting. Okay. There's some validity to that. Number two, necessity. Another reason to interrupt that maybe it's someone else's turn to say something, conversations should be inclusive of everyone in a group. Well, it was two people having a conversation and you interjected yourself. But there are some people who don't give others the opportunity to speak. I was letting somebody say everything they needed because I wanted their information because I've already heard my own. If interrupting is the only way you can have your say, wait for the other person to catch a breath and speak. I have, okay, there we go. Perfect, continue. Don't be that person who monopolizes a conversation. Being a good conversationalist involves actively participating in a discussion and knowing when to interject and at times compliment, which I did several times throughout that conversation and want to know more about that side of the coin. When it's time to listen, stop talking, but take a look for opportunities to inject without with questions or brief statements. Okay, that just... Brief statements or in, with questions to kind of pave the road that you want to go down. Not to set them up for failure, but to acquire the knowledge needed to move us forward as two human beings. Tips for interrupting. Have a specific purpose. When you are jumping into other people's conversation or you are stopping someone's monologue, it's essential that you have a reason for doing it. And the ability to relay... Am I even recording? Yeah, I'm good. All right, anyways. 
<laughs> you're stopping someone's monologue. It's essential that you have a reason for doing it and the ability to relay to that to that person talking states the purpose as briefly as possible. Use proper timing. It's best to wait until the person speaking stops to catch a breath before speaking up. Be as polite as possible. Always speak politely and start the conversation with a polite introduction to your interruption. Some things you may might say include, excuse me, I need to say something here. Do you mind if I interrupt? All right, well, that sounds kind of Karen-ish, but we'll keep going. I have an idea that relates to what you just said. I'd like to add something to that, or I beg your pardon, but I need to say something. All right, still kind of Karen-ish, uh, Karen-ish there, but I'd like to add something to that. All right, cool. Now, this thing is, is this interruption was not needed. You could have just shut your mouth and learned something. Use a gesture. Uh, if your interruption isn't acknowledged, lift a hand, use eye contact, get the person's attention. Never ho- hover. Let's actually just preface this by saying, if you're going to interrupt a conversation in general, not just my conversation. Never hover. That was being done. When you make your gesture, you can say, excuse me for a sec, I'll keep this brief. That wasn't done. Then say, well, then say what you need to say as quickly as possible so they can get back to their conversation. Oh, exit strategy. Have one of those next time. Clear your throat. This is unlike okay, this is likely to have a heads turning in your direction. Take advantage as to whatever you need to say, but do it quickly. Keep a noticeable difference when interrupting someone else's conversation. If you walk right up to the person who is chatting, it may appear that you want to simply listen. Stand back a bit as to make eye contact to show that being part of the conversation isn't what you want. Get clarification. When you are on a business or committee meeting, and the discussion is heading in a direction that you and perhaps others don't understand, It is okay to interrupt. You get an explanation. You may be surprised by how many will thank you later. Chances are, if you don't understand, others don't either. So maybe if you really wanted to include yourself in this conversation, you should have politely cleared your throat, stepped in and be like, can I ask where this uh, conversation stemmed from? And then you can, and then if we feel like it, there's three things that can happen there. We can tie everything up at the end of the day because maybe we're just schmoozing and maybe the schmoozing got a little bit carried away and uh, maybe we kind of need to tone down the conversation into just regular chat in general, which is cool. Two, we can bring the person into the conversation by recapping what we were talking about as soberingly, soberingly as possible because there are drinks around. Or three, or well, two, bring them in, get them up to speed, and then continue with the conversation, a recap, so that they can, if they choose to, be a part of it. Three, they can fuck off. Period. Thank the others for allowing you to interrupt. After you say what's on your mind, show your gratitude for the others allowing you to speak. Well, that didn't happen at the end, but hey, you know, whatevs. When someone starts to gossip, you can interrupt at any point to stop in its tracks. All right, this is a completely different topic from what we were talking. Uh, well, this is a different manner because this had nothing to do. This suggestion number nine has nothing to do with what happened, but it's a good suggestion in general. So when someone starts to gossip, you can interrupt at any point to stop it in its tracks. One of the most important times to interrupt a conversation is when it, it takes when it turns to trash talking someone who isn't there or making fun of anyone. Be careful if that has nothing to do with politics. Stay out of that one altogether. That's when they talk about someone, if that politi- if that's a politician or a celebrity, just stay out of it. You're not gonna win any wars in that one. Uh, in either case, if you continue to stand there listening, even if you don't say a word, you're participating and encouraging this sort of thing. Chances are when you are not with these people, they're gossiping about you. Firmly speak up and change the subject. If they don't get the hint, you can say, I'd rather not discuss her when she's not here to defend herself. If they continue, leave. Okay, so there are some, there are some standard guidelines via the Spruce. Thank you, the Spruce. I appreciate your input on this. Who wrote this? Debbie Maine. Don't know anything about you, Debbie Maine, but it seems like you have a decent foundation for pop, proper conversation. If there's, if uh, I don't know what your other stuff is all about, but hey, you know what? You got my curiosity with this one. I appreciate you putting out nine ways to politely interrupt a conversation on thespruce.com. So, do yourselves a favor. If two people are having a in uh, a, th- a a proper conversation that has a little bit of bourbon behind it, do yourself a favor. Stay the fuck out of it, all right? Don't make a straight line a triangle because you're interrupting the flow of information. You get what I'm saying? In other words, fuck off, come back later, we're busy. Anyways, moving on here. 
I did want to cover, uh, let's see, 20 minutes. Do we want to talk about Cannonball Rental? Well, maybe we can read that. Oh, let, me, let me review this. I got another piece of gear. I got another piece of gear. By the way, it is hot as balls out today. Mm. Oh, thank God for water. And salt. So, I got a new piece of gear. I haven't really talked about it too much. Uh, this was the year, and I'm doing a vlog about it. I, this is the year I scheduled Pelican 2. My DJI Phantom 3 4K, uh, it was slated for retirement. And that re retirement is on schedule. So as of this year, I am officially retiring my my drone, which is a Phantom 3 4K. Uh, it shoots the maximum 4K at 30 frames per second, flies at almost 40 miles per hour in sport mode, has program positioning modes, um can fly one per every bat each battery will get you about 20 minutes worth of flight has gps tracking um and has some indoor indoor positioning although it's a little bit wobbly wobbly because it's an older model but this drone is a zero crash record um, and it's been properly maintenance it has been a great bird very great bird uh, it's been all over the united states it's been to san francisco it's been to the rio grande on the mexican border it's been to San Antonio. It's been to Palm Beach. It's been to Fort Lauderdale. Uh, it's been to the outskirts of New York City. It's flown through blizzards. It's flown over the Isle of Shoals, which is its own island, uh, own string of islands. It's um, it's been a great uh, it's been a great bird, been an absolutely great bird. Uh, but it's yeah, is it getting a little older? Yes, it hasn't lost its flight. It doesn't has it hasn't lost any of its light capabilities. It's just the fact for with with regulations and what I need and how much noise this drone makes when it takes off, uh, it's time that I moved up. And now I'm going to officially retire Pelican 2 um, to light and non-travel duty. So it will not, unless there is an emergency, in an emergency backup situation, unless there's that, it will not be uh, traveling with me anymore. It will no longer uh, be going with me on airplanes or over longer distances, uh, longer than per se outside the New England area, anywhere outside the New England area. But it's been a great bird. Anybody who has a Phantom 3 4K or a Phantom 3 Professional, great bird. Absolutely great bird. One of the first drones to truly be of use to any professional, uh, really. The 4K is a little is a step below the uh, the Phantom 3 Professional because Phantom 3 Professional has light bridge technology, which is an amazing signal retriever. Uh, but great bird, love it, and you know I could continue to use it. But because there was a good deal that I couldn't pass up, I decided to get a second drone, which I was planning to do, and I did, and I settled for at least for now for a DJI Mavic Mini. A Mavic Mini is a smaller version of the Mavic Air, which is a smaller version of the Mavic Pro. The Mavic Mini, now the Mavic is your go-to drone. It's foldable, it's travel friendly, it's great, it's great against wind, it flies super fast, it has all the programmable, programmable mods you need. It also has uh, a lot of uh, obstacle avoidance tracking that is essentially useful. It has modifications, long battery life, it's an overall great drone. Well, then they made the Mavic Air, which had a shorter battery life, about 21 minutes. And then they made the Mavic Mini. The Mavic Mini is a, was, is, is a significant step above the Spark. And even though the Mavic Mini doesn't shoot in 4K, it does shoot in 2.7 HD, which is really, really high definition. It has um, essentially an, it has an excellent new, uh, new generation sensor in it for excellent excellent uh video and photography it's super stable in the air much more stable than the phantom 3 because when the phantom 3 goes up in the air it kind of it has r it, roughly a three foot radius that it will maneuver within it will hover in within that spot but it will adjust it will process and adjust within a three feet barrier also depending upon wind magnetic resistance gps issues it can vary with the Mavic Mini, when it's in GPS mode, it doesn't move. It goes up in the air, and it sits there. It is locked in. And when it breaks, it breaks hard. 
So it's it's way easier to maneuver. It's much smaller. It is the size of a cell phone. All right, and it's mm, it's probably as tall as like your mouse, as your cursor. And then it folds up as well, like your Mavic Pro, and it fits very well into a purse. It comes it, it, it comes basically with its own little bag that fits the drone. It fits all three batteries and the battery charging port that it comes with. Its own fold-out controller, which not only fits a cell phone, but also fits my Lenovo 8-inch tablet. Now, you'll have to get an, ex- an additional cord to a- attach to the tablet, but I had one because this is the Spare Parts Studios, so I happen to have these things that I can put together, so I didn't have to buy one. So I was able to attach my tablet, so I get an 8-inch screen on like a two inch wide tablet a two inch wide controller that is an excellent controller by the way it's not cheap at all the range on the bird is an, is excellent it's about i'd say two miles just about two miles and the range you really really need is anywhere between four thousand and six thousand feet because that's basically gets you to you could at that point you can get to where you need to go and still fly the drone perfectly without any interruptions. Now, uh, the pl- the pros of this bird, it's super compact. It's amazingly quiet. It flies through the woods impeccably. So if you're controlling it, you can take it on a bike path. You can, fl- you can fly it through uh, clearings. You can hover super low. Because one of the issues when you fly a drone, a lot of the older drones that go really fast, the processing time, say you got a drone that's traveling at 25 miles per hour and it's cruising along the water well as it cruises along the water it will actually dip and it will dip and then there's an issue between uh, another visibility processing issue where as it's traveling over water it will descend above the water even though it's not supposed to so what's going to happen is if you keep going really fast the computer doesn't process it in time that it needs to stay above the water at a certain at a certain uh, height and it trashes into the water the Mavic Mini doesn't do that the Mavic Mini stays above uh, at a certain distance the entire time above the water. So if you want to cruise the water hard, if it's flat, I wouldn't try it with waves because if you try to do it over waves, the wave's going to just smack it. But on flat surfaces, it crushes. It crushes beautifully. And I'm fl- I was flying above lily pads the other day. And, of course, the lily pads also had uh, grass that was growing out, and out of the area as well. But to be able to traverse that with very little concern, made the shots I was getting absolutely beautiful. Another, um, and you're doing this without any concern for battery life. And I would say it gets between 25 and 27 minutes worth of battery life. It's slated for 30 maximum, but that's from literally from start up to fall down. But to get over 25 minutes in a small drone is miraculous. And the fact that you get a small drone that weighs less than 250 grams, which is significant because anything under 250 grams, you don't have to pay $5 to the federal government. Not that I have an issue with that. Not that I have an issue with that at all. And Pelican 2 will stay stay registered with the federal government just because on an emergency basis, if I need to pull, pull that out and use it for its 4K purposes, for blizzard conditions, for emergency situations, whatever it is, it's there, it's registered, I can fly it. But Firefly, as I've called it, Firefly 1, I won't need to do that. So that's great. It's an extra five bucks that I can use for filter lens filters or something. That's a great thing about it. Battery life, it's super light. Um, what else? Yes, it's super compact. It's amazingly quiet, though. It's a light buzzing noise. Like, probably, like, say, if you took a hair clipper and you put wings on it and flew it through the woods. That's basically what it sounds like. Probably even quieter. And it's incredibly nimble. And this thing also, when it comes to speed, it has three modes. Cinema, uh, programmable, and uh, sport mode. And all drones come with sport mode. Which basically, it disengages from the GPS signal so that it can fly faster. And this drone will probably get around between 25 and 30 miles per hour. But the conditions have to be really, really good. So maybe if you have a little bit of wind behind it, if you fly it with the wind, you can probably get it above 30 miles per hour. But in cinema mode, which is probably my favorite mode to fly, 
is when, and you could program this into other drones as well. Per, cinema mode slows down the movement of the drone. So you get those cinematic approaches that you really need when you're doing cinematography. And this drone does it amazingly where it slows down and how it pivots and rises and then slowing the gimbal speed down and the buffering between when you stop the gimbal and then it, it comes to a soft stop as opposed to a basically moving up and down uh, like a robot and then and there's no finesse to it. It just kind of glides down and slowly comes to a stop. So you get, it doesn't feel abrupt anyways. So the cinema mode on the Mavic Mini is amazing. It's one of the best things that, it's the one of the best features of it because it's just a little fly, it makes it a little flying eyeball. A little flying eyeball, and it's perfect. And you get all those video qualities that you're looking for in a high resolution, 12 megapixel, 2.7K Super HD camera. And weighs less than your cell phone. Excellent, excellent bird. The package I got was the uh, Flymore package, which is the drone. The battery port system, so it's a, it's a, it's a charge port with three charge ports and you just plug it in. And it tells you the battery life of all the batteries, all three batteries that it comes with right on the top when you just press the button. So you get a charge port, three batteries, the drone itself, all the cords that you'd need, the superchargers, the USB superchargers, all the plugs you would need for if you had a, a iPhone, if you had a USB-C, um, a USB micro. And then of course it comes with Extra props, prop guards, which will come in handy if you're going through areas, uh, if you're moving through FPV type areas very quickly, so that you don't damage the, the the initial props. But it does come with a spare set of props and the controller itself. And the controller itself is awesome because it folds up. You take the stems, you take the toggles off, the joysticks off, and you plug them, you snap them in underneath, and then you close the whole thing along with the antennas. It, everything is so properly designed in it. And on top of that, the, the case is super compact to fit in your backpack, but also fit a couple other essentials, such as a SD to USB chip reader, a 8-inch uh, tablet, a um, uh, and then a couple other essentials as well. But it's perfect. And for $450, you can get your first drone. And this is the one thing. I actually got to text a buddy of mine. If you're into self-defense, uh, like say you have a gun in the house, Say so you have a gun in the house. I would highly recommend if you have a gun, get a drone. If you could fly, now get it, obviously if you live near an airport, it's not going to do you any good. But I highly recommend for home defense and home surveillance, if you have home surveillance and you have a, a gun in the house, I would recommend a drone. Just so you can keep an eye on what's going on above your house because your eyes are only going to be able to see so far. But if you send a bird up, a really a bird that you can quickly get up in the air to see what's going on around your home, then uh, a Mavic Mini or a Mavic Air or a Mavic Pro, which are relatively quiet drones, will be able to will be able to assist you with home defense and home surveillance. Also, an another thing about that too, the DJI Spark only came with a two-axis gimbal, which made the movements of cinematography difficult. However, like the, my DJI uh, Phantom Three. The Mavic Mini also has a three-axis gimbal, so everything is perfectly stable. And like my DJ Mavic, and like my DJI Phantom 3 4K, you can lock the gimbal, making it what it's called FPV mode. So everything is like Top Gun. So you can do that with the flip of a switch on uh, a digital switch on the Mavic Mini as well. And because it's so light and maneuverable and locked in. Uh, it's much easier to do that FPV mode. And I'd like to try that with some moving vehicles or with um, some jet skis, which I've done with the Phantom 3. I've done jet ski uh, tracking with it. I've done boat tracking with it. I'm just curious to see how it would work with jet skis if I did an FPV mode. But I wouldn't try it with the Phantom 3. Uh, I wouldn't get too close with the Phantom 3 because the Phantom 3 is more of a, it's, it's more of a slow burn. It's a, it's a Clydesdale. Uh, it's not a racehorse. As far as... Maybe not a racehorse? Maybe, I don't know. It's not as nimble. Don't get me wrong. You can do a lot with a Phantom 3. But it's a much easier drone to crash than a, than a, uh, a Mavic Mini. Now, it's cons. It doesn't have a lot of the pro programmable settings that the Phantom, the Mavic, or the uh, Mavic Air, or the Inspire have. 
That's one of the issues I have with it. Number two, wind resistance. This thing is not as fast as a Mavic, a Mavic Air, a Phantom 3, an Inspire. It is not as fast as those drones. That being said, with with how light it is and how much slower it is, the fact that, and we're talking 10 miles an hour difference. So if this thing approaches, hits some significant wind, because the higher up you go, you're above the tree line, which means there's more wind. And if there's more wind, that means you're going to have a problem. So you'll get significant wind warnings on your controller telling you, hey, you should descend below a tree line. Because if you descend below the tree line, you're more likely going to get your drone back. Because in cinema mode, your drone is slower, the slowest it can go. In programmable mode, your drone is decent speed, but still slow. But if you're fighting against the wind bad, and you're low enough, but the wind is still bad, you got to put it in sport mode, because that'll give you all the horsepower that you need to get your drone back. And, and that's the thing, is you have 15, 20... If you're flying a drone with 15 to 20 mile per hour winds, you should... I mean, I don't. I wouldn't be flying my drone at 15 mile an hour... 15 to 20 mile an hour winds anyways. Uh, Pelican 2, I would not do it at all. But anywhere between 8 and 12 miles per hour, I would send it up. Because I know that I can get the drone back. I know I can get the drone back. I'm cautious. I can I can accomplish what I need to do without losing the drone. Because I don't just lose... These aren't just... Ca- this isn't just camera equipment to me. These things are perspectives of life that I'm not able to see from where I'm sitting or standing. And that's what I appreciate about these things so much. About the quality of build on them, uh, as far as what they're able to do, this innovative technology that allows me to see the world from a different perspective. These things are like f- they're like friends, they're like coworkers, and I respect them as such because I treat my gear very, very well. Um, and I they have because they're like birds, they have their own personalities. So I do enjoy flying them and making sure that they come back. So if it's twenty miles per hour. Uh, at ground level, I'm not going to send up the Mavic Mini to just go out there into the ocean and see if it can come back. That's not smart because then you're just wasting your money. There's plenty of... If you're thinking about making a YouTube video to see if the drone will come back in 20 mile per hour winds, guess what? There's a, Work on another video because there's already another episode out there like that for, that somebody's already made. So try something different and keep your drone safe. And if you really need something that can fight the wind... If you're really that concerned about losing your drone in the wind, you should not be flying a Phantom or a Ma- uh, or any type of Mavic to begin with, whether it's the Mavic Air, the Mavic uh, the Mavic Air, the Mavic Pro, the Mavic Pro 2, the Mavic Mini, you should be flying an Inspire or a Matrice or something or a big expensive drone like cuz uh, 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 an Inspire will cost you about $4,000 for the Inspire 2. You can fly that thing. But just to let you know, that's a different bird altogether. But you don't need to send up your drones if it's that high of wind. Because the higher up you go, the more likely you are going to uh, encounter higher amounts of wind. And then you're going to lose hundreds of dollars because it just went... It flew away. You couldn't bring it back. It ran out of batteries. And it kerplunked in the ocean. It sucks. Another, but another cool feature is you can switch between return to home and land immediately. So if you're looking to send it to another location and you want it to land there and then you want to, because I, you know, sometimes like you want it to fly somewhere and then you want it to land there. But when you, when you go to land it there, you're going to lose your signal. Well, if you just tell it to land there while it's recording, you can drive off and it will land there and you can make the setting to do it, make it do that. But if it loses signal with you, it'll go up to the pre-designed destination height, which for mine is like 200 and something feet. So it can clear the tree line, tree line, and then it'll go back above. Then it'll fly back to where it, to its original location. I had that issue once when I flew Pelican too, where I was taking off from Massachusetts and the objective was to get to Maine. Well, it flew into New Hampshire, lost signal, and returned to Massachusetts. Thankfully, I was able to find it. It landed exactly where it took off. Amazing. So, um, that being said, you have that option. And anytime you have a drone, your first time flying a drone, those are some options you need to consider. That's an option you need to change is return to home. You want to set your distance and your speed and your height at maximum. I don't care. Do it. But your return to home height needs to be high enough to clear any obstacles that you may encounter. Okay. So anything under 400 feet, you'd be good to go. You can clear that line. 
Also with the Mavic Mini is it has obstacle avoidance uh, on the bottom of it. So anytime it encounters an issue on the uh, a possible obstruction underneath it, it will try to avoid it. What it will basically do is it'll, it'll be like, oh my god, there's ground. Or oh my god, there's water. Or an obstruction, and it'll just bounce up. It'll go up a couple feet as to avoid that. Um, but it doesn't have... It, a con of it is it does not have obstacle avoidance in front of it or on the side of it. However, it is small enough to be... If you are in control of this drone the entire time, you can do wonders with it. It is very stripped down for the most part. Because um, it doesn't have uh, uh, object tracking on it. But I didn't specifically buy it for that. Like the follow me modes, it, doesn't, it does not have that. You would need a Mavic Air or a straight Mavic Pro to do that. But that's not the, that's not the reason I bought it. I bought it because it was small, quiet, nimble, and I can travel with it. And I can make do with some of the, without the stuff that it doesn't have. I'm fine with that. Because if I, my next drone would eventually be like an Inspire 2 or a Mavic. But for now, perfect. Excellent drone. Inexpensive. 450 bucks. You got three batteries. Bought it through Green Toe. Green Toe. Shout out to Green Toe. So definitely give that a whirl. I love it. You'll be seeing videos from it soon. You'll actually be seeing the retirement of Pelican 2. That video coming up hopefully within the next month because I got two videos slated to be in front of it first before uh, I, I release that one. So we are at 41 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and close up shop for today. Uh, I want to once again congratulate my buddy Bobby for, and of course, and his wife for an excellent wedding. Thank you all for inviting me and allowing me to picture, take pictures and video for you and having a sip of your $600 scotch and uh, all that other happy jazz. Congrats and our best wishes to both of you. And I will see you guys very, very soon. As you understand, I had to return home because I have work to do. I wanted to get up early so I could get stuff done like this podcast. So until then, you can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podcast Addict, CastBox, uh, anywhere where podcasts are available. You will find their Spotify there too. They're just not paying me to be on Spotify. But hey, that's okay. Free platform. But until then, find me on anywhere where uh, social media, find me on all social media. I, uh, what are you? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And then, of course, you can email me and message me directly at positive sarcasm at outlook.com. And of course, if you have posing music for bodybuilding, you can find me there as well. You can just check out my website, positive sarcasm.com. If you need a uh, wedding videographer or videographer in general, hit me up. I'll let you know my fees. Until then, if you want to support this podcast, go to positivesarcasm.com slash donate, or you can go to positivesarcasm.com, hit the contact button, and there's a Robinhood banner there. And if you fund your account, you don't have to necessarily spend any money, but if you fund your account, you get a free stock, and I get a free stock. And that's how you help this platform. And you don't have to spend a dime. But until then, I'd like to thank you guys for listening, watching, subscribing, sharing. I will talk to you all in a few days. Recorded here from the Spare Parts Studios, this has been a positive sarcasm presentation.